Our last uh, area of discussion is going to really just uh, cover some things that relate to the integumentary system. And first up, I want to cover a bunch of different terms that you'll commonly hear used in medical arenas. And these relate to different kinds of skin-related conditions. So let me go through these very quickly. You might hear people use the term erythema. Arith and erythema just means having a reddish color. So, for example, if somebody is working out and you notice they get kind of a flush to their face or their arms or legs get kind of a reddish color to them, that would be um, a description of what we call erythema. Jaundice is another term commonly used to describe a skin condition. That's a yellowish appearance of the skin, and it's oftentimes an indicator that there is some sort of liver malfunction occurring. And in uh, Bio 202, we'll learn a little bit more about uh, jaundice and why the skin gets a, a yellowish hue to it. Bronzing is a condition where the, the skin gets more of a tannish or brown color to it. Um, that might happen from tanning, but it can also happen as a result of some different types of diseases, such as Addison's disease. Pallor means having a very pale appearance to the skin, and that's usually an indication that blood flow to the surface or near the surface of the skin has been much reduced. Albinism is a condition where a person genetically does not possess the gene for the proper manufacture of melanin. And so as a result, they cannot make that melanin that's responsible for um, uh, giving skin its pigment or its color. So for example, you can see here these two individuals are brothers. Um, they are both of African-American descent. The gentleman on the right here uh, is normal coloration. Uh, he, in other words, he has normal production of melanin. By comparison, the gentleman on the left here uh, does not possess a functional gene for the manufacture of melanin, and as a result, he appears very light in color. His hair is blondish white in color. His eyebrows are light in color, etc. Uh, hematoma is another commonly experienced skin condition. I would guarantee everybody uh, that's listening to this lecture has had a hematoma probably more than once in their life. Uh, the common word for hematoma is a bruise. And this is just an indication that you've had rupture of some blood vessels under the surface of the epidermis in the dermal layer. Uh, and there's been some blood leaking into that area. And we perceive that on the surface of the skin as this kind of bluish, purplish uh, region. Last one, hemangiomas. Uh, are things that if you have one, you were born with it. These are birthmarks. Okay, birthmarks. And um, this is basically just discolored skin, and it's due to benign tumors. A benign tumor is a tumor that is not cancerous. It's just a growth of tissue, um, usually of, of the blood capillaries in the dermis. And in some cases, hemangiomas are, um, uh, they fade over time. They're not permanent. Those are usually called strawberry birthmarks. Uh, and then there are some types of hemangiomas that are permanent. You have them for life. And those are usually referred to as port wine birthmarks because they're very dark reddish color like the color of port wine. Okay, I want to talk for a minute here about different types of uh, burns of the skin. This is a way that skin can become damaged if it's exposed to excessive heat. And there are different types or degrees of burn depending on which portions of the integument become involved or damaged during the burn. First degree burns, by definition, are those burns that only involve destruction of the epidermis. These tend to be painful because we have receptors in the epidermis and the dermis that perceive the damage to the tissue. Second degree burns are burns that involve all of the epidermis and some of the dermis. Again, these are also very painful because now we're um, directly stimulating pain receptors, etc., that are found in the dermis layer. Third degree burns involve uh, destruction of the epidermis the dermis, and sometimes even down into deep into the hypodermis. And these types of burns tend to have no pain associated with them because we have completely destroyed the sensory receptor cells, the pain receptor cells that would have signaled the brain that the tissue was damaged. 
Now, typically people who have third degree burns are still in a lot of pain because usually surrounding the regions of a third degree ba- pain, sorry, third degree burn will be regions of secondary or second degree burns, and those are very painful. So they're still going to see a lot of, of pain. Um, second degree burns are where we often see blisters forming. It's a very common feature of second degree burns. And um, we do get epidermal regeneration from um, in second degree burns, whereas with third degree burns, because we just completely destroy the tissue, it's uh, not possible for the epidermis to regenerate. And so we often get people having very uh, extensive scarring and disfigurement from as a result of um, third degree burn. The, the typical treatments for burn patients, the number one most important thing in the first few hours after a person experiences burn is to get rehydrated. Because remember, the skin, the epidermis, serves as an excellent waterproofing barrier due to all of those lipids and keratin that's present. And when you burn that layer off, you have now taken away the body's primary means of preventing water loss to the external environment. So a big danger to burn patients when they first present in the emergency room is dehydration. The other big risk, the other big danger uh, is infection because remember the skin serves as a barrier and helps to prevent colonization of bacteria and if you again if you remove the skin the epidermis and parts of the dermis, then you have basically stripped away your one of your body's primary mechanisms of, of protecting itself against pathogens like bacteria. Now, how do we estimate the size of burns? You've probably heard before you know, the people on the news will say, oh, there was a house fire and, and uh, there was a male that was in the house fire and he suffered burns on 52% of his body. Well, the, ra- the way that we estimate the size of a burn is to use a um, procedure called the rule of nines. And it goes something like this. In an adult, that's this guy here, um, we divide out the body into quadrants of nine. For example, the front and back of each arm, of, of one arm counts for 9% of the total surface area of the body. The front and back of the other arm co- accounts for another 9% of the body. The front of the torso accounts for 18%, that's 2 times 9. The back of the torso accounts for another 18%, again, 2 times 9. Uh, Each leg accounts for 18% of the surface area, so the front of one leg would be 9%, the back of one leg would be 9%, the front of the other leg would be 9%, the back of the other leg would be 9%. And then the inguinal region around the groin accounts for roughly 1%, and again, I said that, uh, oh, I didn't say, the head accounts for 9%. So you can see where we get the idea of rules of nines. Almost everything is some sort of um, uh, factor of nine. Now, for little kids, uh, the rules of nine doesn't really apply because uh, their head is a lot bigger relative to the rest of their body than is true for adults. So we have to use a little different estimation scheme. In children, uh, their head accounts for roughly 18% of their surface area. The front of the torso is another 18%. The back of the torso is another 18%. Um, Each arm is worth 9%, so the front and back of the left arm is worth 9%. The front and back of the right arm is worth 9%. But each leg is only worth 14%. And then the inguinal region around the groin is again worth 1%. So if somebody had burned their entire right arm and the front of their torso, we would say that they would have burned a total of um, 9% plus 18% equals 27% of their body. Okay, Um, if a person does get a burn or some sort of other injury to the skin, the next question is how does the skin go about repairing that that damage? How does it go about healing? Well, there are two, it turns out, um, main processes by which the skin can heal. One option is, and by the way, this this part of the lecture is located in the chapter with histology rather than in the chapter with the skin. Uh, So make sure you do go back and look at it, that portion of the histology chapter to get this information. Um, The two main ways that the skin can repair itself is it can either fully regenerate so that you, when, when it's all healed, you cannot see a scar and there's no indication that there was damage to the tissue, 
Or the other option is it can undergo fibrosis, which is going to lead to the formation of a scar. And very briefly, um, the difference between the two here is the extent of the wound. If I have a very small wound, uh, let's say a paper cut, then the distance between one side of uh, the injury and the other side of the injury is relatively small. And that means that the stratum basale on either side of the injury is likely going to be able to grow back together very readily and cover over the underlying dermis and you'll get complete closure of the wound and you'll get no scarring. On the other hand, if the wound is larger and the distance, uh, let's say that this is my wound and here's my epidermis up here, E for epidermis and D down here for dermis, and the, and the, the distance from one side of the wound to the other is very large, like say a knife wound, for example, the likelihood that the stratum basale on this side and the stratum basale on that side are going to be able to grow back together is very small. And as a result, you don't get complete regeneration of the tissue. You get a modified version of uh, dermal tissue and epidermal tissue forming in the area. And this leads to a high production of collagen fibers and this process we call fibrosis or scarring occurs. The primary cells responsible for the manufacture of the scar tissue should not be a surprise. It's fibroblasts. They're the, the main players in secreting um, uh, connective tissue matrix. Now, if I have an, ex an extremely extensive wound site, such as what we see in burn patients that have large regions of the body burned, then um, even relying on the fibrosis uh, regeneration to take care of the problem may not be the best of situation because it could lead to extensive disfigurement because such incredibly huge areas scar over. And so in this case, we often will use what are called skin grafts. And those skin grafts can be what we call either autographs, meaning that we get the skin from the patient themselves, or they can be what we call allografts, meaning that we get the skins from a donor, uh, oftentimes a cadaver. I want to focus just for a second here on an autograph. How would we go about um, getting skin from a patient who's had a bunch of skin burned off? Well, let's say we have a patient who's had a very severe arm burn. We can use, um, take a little swath of skin from someplace like, say, their leg, uh, as in this picture, and then they run it through something that looks to me uh, uh, like a modified pasta machine. And they, they, they run it through this modified pasta machine, and what it does is it punches a bunch of holes in that skin, and so it means that once we have a bunch of holes in that little square of skin, we can, we can stretch that skin out and make it much larger so that it'll cover a much bigger area. And then we can take and literally graft that uh, skin onto the area where the burn is. And because these holes are relatively close together, what we're doing here is, uh, is, is decreasing the distance that the stratum basale has to uh, cross in order to seal back together. And here is an after picture of a patient who has had skin from another region of his body uh, transplanted onto his arm. And you can see the mesh-like pattern here uh, that was the result of that modified pust machine, if you will. But it does present a much better solution in terms of reduced uh, scarring than would if we just left the arm to heal completely on its own without the, the, the skin graft.